Richard Kingston, uh, who's a senior lecturer in urban planning and smart cities at the University of Manchester. He gave a presentation at the Geodesign Summit in Europe, and his talk is going to be looking at participatory geodesign. So, Richard. Thank you. Well, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon in um, approximately six minutes. Um, I've been sort of working with GIS for, uh, for nearly over 25 years now. In fact, I feel like this is now like I need to go and sit down here and confess that you know, I'm a GIS addict. Um, and during that time, I started off doing a lot of things around looking at participatory uh, GIS. Um, so what I want to talk about a little bit about is, is um, what can we learn from previous examples of using uh, GIS for public engagement, what can we learn from PPGIS, public participation GIS, that could be applied to participatory um, uh, geo design. So you may be familiar with these two books, if not I would recommend you go off and read them at some point. Ground Truth, the book by John Pickles in the mid-90s uh, was quite critical of GIS. GIS was this evil tool uh, that gave lots of power to those people that already had lots of power um, and it was doing evil things and supporting decision making and, and uh, was, was not uh, something that was, was useful for the community. And the, um, the GIS community responded to that. Maybe some, I know there's some people in the room who were at the, uh, the meetings in Santa Barbara um, where um, they, they came up with the idea of part participatory GIS. And recently, uh, it's been suggested here that geodesign helps um, make it possible for the public to engage in the process and contribute in meaningful ways. But I always like to have a but in my talks as well. But one of the problems is, and it was alluded to yesterday, I think uh, one of the speakers talked about the, the bell curve and at the two, the two extremes of the bell curve, you get uh, what, what I would call a, a, a dominant kind of vocal minority that might be against some kind of proposal. So most participatory processes often involve citizens responding to a set of proposals uh, rather than, say, co what we might call co-producing the designs themselves. Um, and often, it's a limited set of participants that come along to some kind of public engagement meeting, what we might refer to as the, the usual suspects that were referred to yesterday, those two extremes at the end of, of that bell curve. So what can be done um, to overcome some of these problems around how you can engage people in geodesign, engage people in decision-making that has a, a spatial component about place? Um, and what I just want to focus on is a case study of this was a, a research project that we did a couple of years ago. Um, it was fairly large. It was a th I worked it out earlier. It was $4 million uh, from the European Commission uh, to look at green and blue space adaptation planning in 12 municipalities across Europe. Um, and what we were trying to do was engage local communities in decision-making about how uh, they adapt their neighbourhoods to climate change. Um, and the starting point for this was, was mapping, was GIS maps. So we engaged communities by getting them to understand the climate change problem uh, through showing them lots of GIS maps. A lot of these were online, some of them were paper-based. Um, but also integrating that with indigenous knowledge, what we might now term as volunteer geographic information. So we have the official data that is produced by government at different scales, um, but also local knowledge from the community themselves and using storytelling as a way of that. So one example would be that we would show them flood risk maps and someone, a senior member of the, the community might say, well, I've lived here all my life. It never once has flooded in this area. Um, and allowing to, the, to on, the, on this toolkit that we do, to volunteer their own geographic information, pinpointing particular locations, um, even uploading historic photographs. And others who were saying, well, I remember in 1935 it flooded in this particular area, but your uh, environment agency flood maps do not actually highlight this area as, as at, at risk from flooding. So a, a key aspect of um, our, our approach uh, has been the uh, ability to uh, share different types of spatial data that's official data and non-official data, uh, crowdsourced um, data, um, that has resulted in, in action actually on the ground. So what this has led to is that we've essentially been using an online mapping toolkit. Um, this was using um, Google Maps. We had 12 municipalities across Europe, so we went for Google Maps as a common kind of platform. Not all the municipalities we worked with, you'll be uh, sad to hear, had Arc uh, GIS. Some of them were using other, other uh, GIS products. Um, so we went for this sort of generic platform. 
Um, and what it allowed um, the, the communities to do was to, uh, using this spatial data to inform decision making. So one of the maps here is just showing, for example, the red areas. Over 80% of the population in those areas that are zoned red uh, were living in a basement or ground floor uh, property. And the blue zones then are flood risk areas. So we were able to show them that there was a real problem. So for some uh, um, members of the community who, who didn't, who were sort of not convinced that climate change was happening, uh, we were able to show them the fact that there was this risk associated with living in these neighborhoods. And the whole idea was that we were involving citizens, different stakeholders, in essentially turning more traditional sort of coral pleth mapping into an initial, a final design. So the outcome of all of this was an adaptation action plan. This is just one example from one of our partners, London Borough of Sutton, um, and engaging uh, a range of stakeholders where the starting point was this GIS mapping to convince them that there was a particular problem around climate change. So there wasn't just flooding, there was uh, uh, data on there, there was a whole range of other things around uh, the urban heat island effect, um, and it allowed uh, the community and the decision makers to come together to develop uh, this spatial plan that had allow and now allows this particular area in, in London Borough of Sutton to come up with design interventions, physical interventions in the neighbourhood, in the community, uh, to adapt and change to, to the uh, impacts of, of climate change. And one of the things that we've learnt over the years from the, a lot of the research we've done, that whilst there are lots of opportunities to engage, we, we've got the tools, we've got the technology, we can develop our web mapping servers and, and, and uh, online support tools, um, there, there's still a real problem in engaging uh, citizens. And the scale at which you are planning and designing things is, is very critical. And what we found is that at the very local level, you will get a high pr percentage of the population who are coming along and, and getting involved. But as you go up the, the spatial scale to regional and national, the proportion, the, the absolute numbers might be relatively large, but the percentage of the wider population is very small. And it's only when, at say, a regional or national scale, that you suddenly then go back to identifying particular places on the ground back at the neighbourhood level, that suddenly citizens then want to be involved. But it's often too late for them to be involved because decisions have been taken at that higher spatial scale. So there's a kind of optimum spatial scale at which it's much easier, I would say at the neighbourhood scale, much more easier to get people engaged, they're much more concerned about their own neighbourhood than it is as, as you progress up um, the spatial scales. So, I think the GIS tools that we've developed and been using uh, have helped build the evidence base that has then convinced people to get engaged and understand a particular problem, this in this case of um, uh, engaging people in, in developing adaptation action plans. Um, and in, incessant, in essence, has informed the, uh, the planning and designing of those adaptation action plans. So we've kind of used a, a combination of GIS um, as, as the evidence base to support the design interventions that have taken place on the ground. Uh, and we did this for 12, 12 municipalities across Europe. The toolkit that we developed is open source. It's uh, freely available for anyone to, uh, to download. And I think on here I've got the, yeah, the web URL there, um, so anyone can actually go and, and get this tool and, and rebuild it for their particular uh, neighbourhood. Thank you.